At this point, we've seen enough juvenile criminal cases to understand that children and teenagers are entirely capable of diabolical, violent actions. In the same way, we've also seen enough juvenile and adult criminal cases to understand that the environment and circumstances surrounding one's upbringing often play an important role in the kind of life they can go on to live and the activities they carry out. These two realities found their intersection in the case of Catherine and Curtis Jones. The siblings, who were 13 and 12 at the time of the conviction, had endured a myriad of abnormalities in their formative years. These experiences led them to a place of meticulously plotting the annihilation of their primary and perceived accomplice oppressors. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we will be taking a look at the previously unknown story of the youngest convicted adult murderer, Catherine and Curtis Jones. Want to know what kind of experiences they were subjected to at the time that led them to a place of violence at such a young age? Or are you interested in finding out how these two ended up being the youngest adult criminals? Keep watching to have these questions and many more answered. The exact date of Catherine's birth is uncertain, but she was born in 1985 to her parents, Curtis Jones and Stacy Parks. While this seemed to be the start of something beautiful, underneath was a gory reality that the Jones couple had been living in. According to Stacy, she had been enduring physical abuse from Curtis since just after the pair began dating. The abuse was so bad that one of Curtis's violent outbursts, which happened when Stacy was pregnant with their first child, Catherine, caused her uterus to tear, and Catherine was born prematurely. About a year later, on the 31st of May, 1986, the couple welcomed their second child, Curtis Fairchild Jones. The family of four continued to live in relative happiness, and they cherished the company of one another. Or at least, that was what it seemed like when the two young children were just happy to see their parents around. Beyond what was obvious to the children, Stacy continued to endure physical abuse from Curtis. It is speculated that the children became aware of the situation at some point. Eventually, it all became too much for Stacy to bear, so she packed her things and left home in 1989. Unable to take the then four-year-old Catherine and three-year-old Curtis with her for fear that her mother would reject the children because they were biracial, Stacy left the two children in the care of Curtis Sr. At the time, Stacy thought that she was doing the best thing for her children, but she could not have been further from the truth. With Stacy's departure, what was once a foursome had become a trio, and so the children would learn to adjust to the new arrangement and enjoy the company and attention of their father. But that too would soon be threatened. It is unclear just how things developed from 1989 when Stacy left Curtis, but by 1994, just five years later, she could tell that all was not well with her children. In the five years after Stacy left Florida for Kansas, one of Curtis's male relatives had begun living with him and the children. At first glance, this doesn't seem like too much to worry about. After all, family members live together for financial or other reasons at different points in their lives, right? Well, the problem with this particular relative that no one was aware of or just chose to ignore was that he had a very concerning criminal history. In addition to spending six years in prison for robbery, this unidentified relative was also a registered pedophile. In 1993, just a year before suspicions began to arise, this relative had been convicted of sexual crimes involving his then girlfriend's daughter, who was 14 years old at the time. In 1994, when Catherine and Curtis visited their mother in Kansas for the holidays, Curtis revealed to Stacy that he had been enduring abuse at the hands of this relative. Curtis Jr., being the only other male in the house, had to share a room with the relative, and according to him, he was being fondled by the older man. As it turns out, Catherine was also suffering the same fate, but it is unclear whether she spoke up at this time. Following Curtis's statements, reports were made and an investigation began, but records show that investigations into the case were closed after young Curtis changed his story, saying it had been a lie, most likely under compulsion or fear. That might have been the single mistake marking the point where everything began to go wrong. On the part of Curtis, his parents, and the authorities, if someone had done something a little differently, things might have turned out much better than they did. Sadly, that was not the case, and a huge tragedy was in sight. 
In the meantime, Curtis and Catherine continued to suffer physical and sexual abuse with short-lived periods of outspokenness and quests for justice. Records show that two years later, in 1996, another case regarding the Jones children was opened. An investigation was undertaken concerning Curtis sustaining a bruised and swollen eye. It is uncertain just how far this investigation went and if any substantial findings or actions were made, but judging from the fact that things continued in the same abusive manner in the Jones household, it is very unlikely. Just months before the murder, in September of 1998, a third investigation was started. This time it was concerning Catherine. The 13-year-old girl had run away from home, and her school teacher, being worried for her welfare, made a report stating concerns that Catherine was being taken sexual advantage of. An investigation was opened, and authorities admitted to finding some indicators that Catherine was being sexually abused. However, like the ones before it, the investigation was short-lived. According to Catherine, she had previously tried to tell her father of the abuse, but he did not believe her and took the side of the relative in question. By the time the investigations began, Curtis Sr. intimidated Catherine into lying to the officials and denying that the abuse ever occurred. Also, frightened by the possibility of being separated from her family, Catherine gave in and the investigations were brought to a stop. Despite not diving deep into the situation, as many believe that they should have, investigators reportedly warned Curtis Sr. about his relative living with the family. Given the criminal history of this relative and the danger he posed to the children. While trouble in the form of investigation was warded off in the Jones household, trouble continued to brew within. Both Curtis and Catherine were still being taken sexual advantage of by the family member. And it seemed like their father and his girlfriend, Nicole Spites, who had begun living with the family, could not be any less alarmed about the situation at hand. The siblings soon found companionship and solidarity with one another, with Catherine revealing that Curtis was the only one who believed her when she came out with the sexual allegations against their relative. He said that he believed her because it happened to him too. The breaking point for Catherine, according to her, was when a few days after the last investigation was closed, she was taking a shower. The relative in question came into the bathroom, pulled the shower curtains open, and began masturbating. The traumatized Catherine huddled in the corner of the bathroom and sobbed until he was done. When he was done, he left 50 cents on the top of the toilet seat for Catherine. After the incident, Catherine wrote in her diary, I'm going to kill everyone. She was angry that she and her brother's cries for help were going unanswered by her father and his girlfriend. And so she concluded that they deserved to die alongside their abuser. Catherine eventually told Curtis about her desires to end the adults' lives, and the pair began plotting to bring this dream to life. They were going to free themselves from torment by killing their abuser and eliminating the chance of this event ever happening again by killing the people they believed allowed the abuse to occur in the first place. On the 6th of January, 1999, the siblings' plan was set into motion. With their father briefly stepping out of the house and their abuser, not expected to be back until later that evening, the children were home alone with Nicole. Hoping to receive minimal opposition by killing one person at a time, with no one else in the house, the two set out. The 29-year-old Sonia Nicole Spites sat at the dining room table, working on a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle while the children went and retrieved their weapon of choice, their father's 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Catherine took the first shot, hitting Nicole in her stomach. However, she dropped the gun due to the rebound of the shot she fired. Curtis picked up the gun and ran wild, shooting at Nicole and all her surroundings. In all, nine bullets were fired, four which fatally wounded Nicole. As soon as the shots were fired and Curtis caught his breath, reality set in, and he began to freak out at the realization that he had killed someone. This wasn't just some fantasy in our heads anymore. It was real, Catherine said in an interview. Catherine did her best to calm her brother down, and the pair set to work in an attempt to clean up the scene. They dragged Nicole's body away from the dining room and tried to use bleach to clean up the blood stains. After that, the two tried their best to make it look like a robbery had occurred, and then they fled the house, stopping briefly at their neighbors to tell them that they had shot the gun by accident. Having tied loose ends up to the best of their ability, Catherine and Curtis hid in the woods nearby their house. It is unclear just who alerted the police about Nicole's death, 
However, it is likely to be the neighbors whom Curtis and Catherine confessed to, or perhaps Curtis Sr., came home to his girlfriend's dead body and alerted the authorities. Either way, the police were alerted and investigations began. One could say that this was the only investigation into the happenings at the Jones household that ever yielded any actual results. Learning from the witness reports of the neighbors that Curtis and Catherine were responsible for the murder, the police went in search for them. The children were eventually found on the morning of the 7th of January, 1999. They were in the woods near their house, where they had hidden for the night. And now reality and the consequences of their actions were staring them in the face. At the ages of 12 and 13, Curtis and Catherine were the youngest people to be charged as adults for first degree murder. If found guilty, which was very likely to happen, they were to be sentenced to life in prison. However, seeing as they were very young, prosecutors were able to strike a deal with the children, allowing them to be tried for second degree murder, which had a sentence of only 18 years in probation for life. This deal also meant that there was not going to be a proper trial of the children's case. No witnesses, no evidence, nothing. Young, inexperienced, and scared, the children accepted the deal. Through all of this, neither Catherine nor Curtis spoke up about the real reasons for their actions, most likely anticipating that they would not be believed as it had happened in the past. It soon became widely accepted that they killed Nicole out of spite for taking all of their father's attention away from them and because he had planned to marry her. The media and other onlookers believed that the children feared that their father's relationship with Nicole would affect the current dynamic they had with their mother. Alan Landman, Curtis's lawyer, said about their silence, it's almost like they had a pact of silence and for some reason they thought that that would help them. He said that had he been aware of the abuse at the time of the trial, they could have had a much better opportunity at getting a better sentence. However, Mayor Todd Goodyear, an official at the Beverly County Sheriff's Office, firmly believed that the children's actions were inexcusable. In his words, there are a lot of people who have been abused and didn't do something like this. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your actions. And they did pay the price for their actions. In August, of 1999, now aged 13 and 14 years old, Curtis and Catherine were each sentenced to 18 years in prison, followed by a lifetime of probation. There didn't seem to be much activity in the siblings' prison lives for the most of their first decade in prison. In 2004, however, Curtis gained a short taste of freedom when Hurricane Francis wreaked havoc on the facility where he was being held. Age 19 at the time, Curtis and several other teenagers fled the juvenile detention center, but their freedom was short-lived and they were recaptured just 24 hours later. As punishment, his sentence was extended by 318 days. Five years later in 2009, the truth of the circumstances surrounding the murder came to light. In an interview with the Florida Today newspaper, Catherine revealed that she and her brother were taken sexual advantage of and their frustrations led them to murdering Nicole. Catherine expressed regret for taking Nicole's life, but also mentioned that she was relieved when she got to prison. She said, I know it sounds like really messed up, but there was a point where I was just away from all that and I was by myself and I was safe. Catherine also revealed in the interview that she had only seen her brother once since they were imprisoned. The siblings used to communicate by mail, but that stopped when Curtis was moved to a new prison facility and the warden said it was unacceptable for them to communicate as they were co-defendants in the case. Ramus Fleming, a U.S. Navy senior, read a 2009 story and was touched by Catherine's experiences. He reached out to her in writing and the two became pen pals. The pair sparked a romance through their letters and got married in November 2013 at the Hernando Correctional Institution Chapel. Catherine was 28 years old at the time she got married to Ramus. Ramus himself soon began making plans and adjustments to allow him to support his wife better as she was soon to be released from prison. Around the time that Catherine was to be released, Ramus retired as a naval officer to allow him more time to walk her through life outside of prison, as a lot had changed since she was 13 years old. After serving a little over 85% of their original sentence, Catherine and Curtis were released from prison. The exact date of Catherine's release is uncertain, but she was released roughly two weeks before her brother Curtis, who was released on the 28th of July, 2015. The two were aged 30 and 29 years old, respectively. Curtis left prison as an ordained Christian minister 
and has gone on to continue his life as one. Catherine, on the other hand, has gone after a more traditional life. Unfortunately, her marriage with Ramus did not work out too well, but she has forged ahead and has so much to be grateful for. She received a presidential academic scholarship for school and will be able to attend college as long as she can maintain a 3.75 GPA. Catherine is also contributing efforts to ensure fair sentencing of young people. Both Curtis and Catherine are working hard at adapting to the technological and social changes that occurred in the 16 years that they were in prison, while also making sure that they do not violate the rules of their probation. So far, all appears to be going smoothly. Thanks for tuning into Twisted Minds. That was the case of Catherine and Curtis Jones. So why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.